Okay, we are recording. It is 10 a.m. We are live. Welcome back to Structural Analysis. Hopefully everybody had an enjoyable three-day weekend um, and uh, ready to get back and, and, uh, uh, and do some structural analysis. We're starting a new topic today uh, with, with trusses. Um, uh, just a couple uh, brief announcements, though. Uh, attendance are up to date. Uh, as for the uh, homework, uh, so you all have just turned in homework 2.4 today. Uh, so the previous homework's been graded, the solution's online, and today you're going to be assigned homework 3.1, which is your first homework uh, on trusses. And uh, that's going to be the main topic uh, of today. You can see I've got a, uh, a truss drawn here on the board. This is going to be the example that we work on uh, later on. Um, I'm guessing that most of you have had some basic experience with trust analysis. Um, uh, you probably looked at this in statics. I'm not sure if you looked at it in uh, mechanics of deformable bodies. Um, but again, the, the, my overall theme with the class is to try and uh, represent some topics that you've probably learned before, uh, develop some simpler tools to assess them, but use those simpler tools to analyze structures that might seem a, a bit more complicated. But uh, trust me, that this, uh, this isn't all that bad. See, I, I had a pun in there because I said, "Trust me, it's not bad." It's, see, that, that that's kind of difficult. You know, I'm 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 telling all these. Uh, uh, you know, usually when we're in class, I have all these. You know, really bad. You know, like dad jokes, the the really bad puns, and uh, I can't really tell. I mean, I'm I'm talking to a camera, so I can't really see if I'm uh, if I'm getting a good reaction out of you. Yeah, everybody's because, gotta you know stay muted until they want to talk. Yeah, so it's hard to get a good laugh track. Yeah. If my camera picked up the side, you'd be hearing one. Yeah, maybe a laugh track. Get, 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 get. Yeah, I need I need a little sound effect like when I say reaction, you know, because because we did reactions. All right, all right, all right I'll stop. <laughs> all right, let's get into uh, sides have been split. Good. This is what this is what I want. Uh, all right, let's talk about trusses. Um, so. Trusses are something that you're going to see in a wide variety of, of structural engineering uh, applications. Um, you're going to see them in buildings. You're going to see them in bridges. Uh, they're a very, very common uh, uh, means of resisting load in, in, uh, in structures. Now, if you want a, a rigorous definition of what a truss is, uh, basically, it's an arrangement of, of straight members uh, in, in basically triangular patterns to, to form a structure or a component of a structure. You know, for instance, if you have a roof, a roof can be comprised of a series of trusses uh, or a bridge can be a series of trusses. Trusses are very, very common in roof systems and they're very common uh, in bridges uh, as well. Now, um, before I get into the, the, the math behind it, I do want to mention a couple things about trusses just from a, 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 a 30,000 foot view. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages to using trusses. Um, one of the advantages is that when you take, a, let's say, a given situation and you design, let's say, a beam versus designing a truss, the truss is going to be a lot more lightweight, uh, and it's also going to be a lot stiffer. So when you look at the, the overall deflections, you're going to find that the truss deflects a lot less than, the, than a comparable beam would. Uh, so you do get those disadvantages, but one of the other downside, or, what, or the downside, I guess, on the other end, is that trusses can be expensive because uh, instead of a beam, like you might have, you know, like a really heavy beam, but it's just a single member, one single beam uh, resisting that load. Trusses are a bunch of little members that have to be, you know, each of those members have to be fabricated. You have to fabricate a connection for each of those, and so trusses tend to be a bit more expensive, but it's a trade-off. I mean, depends on what controls your design. If you're trying to reduce weight and get a stiffer design, then go with the truss. If that isn't as big a deal for the situation you're looking at, go with a, a, a beam or a frame or something like that. Um, so I just want to make sure that we've got the, the 30,000 foot view uh, on this as well. Now, let's talk about the, the math a bit. Let's talk about the assumptions. So when we analyze a truss, um, trusses tend to fall within a, a little bit of a unique category within structural analysis because we have certain behavioral assumptions uh, about how a truss uh, behaves and, and how, how it performs uh, in the real world. Uh, so when we analyze a truss, we make really the following three assumptions. 
Uh, but these assumptions all lead to, to one conclusion, which I'll get at in a second. But if you want these three assumptions, this is basically going to be it. So number one, we assume that all of the members are connected by frictionless joints. So we're, we're, we don't really consider friction uh, in the analysis. That really never comes up a lot in a lot of our, our structural analysis anyways. Um, we do have uh, friction that we consider in some steel design. Uh, for instance, when we're designing uh, certain types of connections, we have to account for the friction uh, in, in that design. Um, but two and three are probably much more important from a from an analysis and engineering perspective. Uh, we do assume that all of the loads are applied only at the joints. So for instance, when you're having, like if you look here on the camera, when you see this truss, here's a truss, the only loads on the system are only at the joints where the members connect. And so in real life, you know, for instance, if you had a load maybe you know, somewhere in the middle, we would just assume that that load was distributed. You know, let's say it was right here. We put half that load here and half that load here. We always make that assumption uh, in truss analysis. The other, uh, the third assumption, and this really isn't so much an assumption because we actually fabricate trusses this way. Uh, we assume that the centroids of all of the members all meet at a given point. So for instance, if you're looking at this uh, image here on the, uh, on the screen, you know, I have a, a, a joint, uh, this is a gusted connection in a truss. And if you were to like sort of draw a line, you know, where, you know, in the middle of all those members, you know, like here's that one, I'm using my mouse, so forgive, oh, forgive me if, I, if I'm a little off. Um, but you can see that one kind of goes here, that one kind of, oh God, that was bad. Uh, but you kind of get the idea that if I connect all of the centroids, that they all meet a common point. We actually do that on purpose uh, when we fabricate. The, in, in steel fabrication land, we call that the work point, the, where, where all of those centroids uh, meet. But we actually fabricate them so all the centroids meet at a common point, and there's a reason for that. If all the centroids all meet at the same point when we apply loads, we don't get any moment, okay? So, and, and that's, that's really the, the, the kicker with a truss. See, when you take all of those three assumptions and you apply them to a, a real structure, what you get is this. When you assume that the joints don't carry any friction, that all the centroids all meet at a common point, and all the loads are applied to those, uh, to those joints, you don't get any shear and moment. And what happens is the members themselves only carry axial load. And so we, we uh, make those assumptions, uh, A, to simplify truss analysis, but it's actually also a, a bit conservative. For instance, later on, um, uh, we'll be uh, using some software to analyze uh, structures. And let's take this structure that I have here on the board. If I were to analyze this structure two different ways, one as a truss using the assumptions we just discussed and one as a frame sort of taking those assumptions and throwing them away, what you'll find is that the axial forces you get in the members are actually a bit larger if, uh, if you assume that it's a truss. So not only is it a bit conservative, but it also makes the uh, analysis a, a bit simpler. So it sort of works uh, on both sides. So, the overall thing that you need to keep in mind when you're analyzing a truss is that when you cut a section through an arbitrary member in some structure, you could get at most three unknown forces. And we talked about this before. So if I cut a section through an arbitrary structure, I could get a force in the X direction, a force in the Y direction, and a moment. You know, the three equations, three unknowns. But when I cut a section through a truss member, the only thing I'm going to get is an axial load. So the member is either going to be in tension or it's going to be in compression or I get, you know, the force could be zero. You could have a zero force member. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, later. So sometimes truss members are called two force members because they're either experiencing tension or compression. I kind of don't really like that name because it implies that, you know, there's an axial load and something else. That's kind of how I've always thought of it. So to me, it's just, it's a, an axial member. It's either ex, uh, experiencing tension or it's experiencing compression. Now, um, it might have been a while since you've done a truss analysis, um, it, but regardless, you probably, if you did these in statics or mechanics of deformable bodies, you probably remember these terms. Again, it might have been a while since you've done it, and that's okay. Uh, but when we have a truss, you know, like what we have here on the board or what you have here on the screen, we have two different ways to analyze that truss. And by analyze the truss, what I mean is if I've got this truss, I'm talking about determining 
what is the internal force inside each of these members? You know, how much force is inside this member? Is it 30 kips in tension? Maybe this one's 20 kips in compression. Maybe this one's zero. I, I, um, and there's two different ways of doing that. The first method is the method of joints. The method of joints is where we uh, isolate a given joint and we assess the equilibrium of that joint. We do each joint one by one until we've completely solved the entire structure. And then the second is the method of sections. And the method of sections is where we use our secret weapon of structural engineering, the samurai sword or the lightsaber, and we cut a section uh, through the truss and we determine the forces along that section. Now, there are some upsides and downsides to each method. So for instance, if you're looking at the method of joints, the method of joints is a bit tedious because you have to do it over and over and over again, but it's thorough. If you apply a method of joints approach, you will solve the entire truss. Um, and not only do I find that just important just from an uh, analysis perspective, but later on when we look at deflections, not only are you gonna have to solve a truss once, but you're gonna have to solve it twice. So I actually spend much more time on the method of joints than I do the method of sections. The method of sections is uh, easy in that, you know, for instance, if I have this really, really big truss and I only want the force, let's say in this one member, that would be a method of sections uh, problem. So to me, like uh, the method of sections, like one of the best places that it's applied is the FE exam. Because a lot of times you'll be given this truss and you'll say, okay, what's the force in this member? If you use the method of joints, it'll take forever. But if you use the method of sections, you can cut a section some moments and boom, there you go, there's your answer. And so it, it's a really good tool for finding a force in one member. But, uh, uh, but the downside is that it would be much more tedious if you had to solve the entire truss uh, that way. Now, when you're employing the method of joints, the, again, like I said, so you take your structure and you start investigating each joint one by one until you've solved for all of the internal forces and all of the members. Um, the idea behind it is that, you know, if I've got my structure and I want the structure to be in equilibrium, well, then each individual joint has to be in equilibrium. So I investigate each joint one by one, and I use the equations of equilibrium to determine my unknown forces. And I just keep doing that until I solve the entire structure. And so the idea is that if the truss is in equilibrium, each joint has to be in equilibrium. But there's a, a little bit of a, a, a strategic uh, point you need to be aware of. Remember our assumptions. One of the assumptions was that all the loads are applied at the joints and all of the members all meet at that at one point at that common joint. Well, I'm going to bring back a statics term that it might have been a while since you've talked about this. When you first uh, are in statics, the first thing that you focus on is the statics of a particle. Uh, in other words, all of the forces all meeting at a common point. We have a, a name for that in statics land. We call it a concurrent force system where all the forces all meet at a common point. And when you're taking statics, you always look at those systems first because you have your equations of equilibrium are just sum of forces. You know, sum of forces in the x direction, sum of forces in the y direction, and if you're in 3D, sum of forces in the z direction. You don't start exploring the concept of moments until the forces don't meet at a common point. So the point is, whenever you're looking at a method of joints analysis, you only have two equations of equilibrium if it's a plane truss, if it's in two dimensions. You have a sum of forces in the x direction, and the sum of forces in the y direction. And so that keys into a very strategic aspect. So like if I was looking at this truss here on the board, in fact, if it, I'll just go ahead and move on to the next slide. This is the truss that we're going to be working on. So I've got this truss. I can't start my analysis by looking at, let's say, joint B. That doesn't work. So here I've got a truss, and I've got all these members all framing in. There's five joints. Um, and let's take joint B. Well, I know I've got this 20 kip load going down, but I've got, what, one, two, three, four members framing into joint B. I can't really handle that right now because I only have two equations of equilibrium. Two equations of equilibrium and four unknown members tells me I can't start my analysis at joint B. I have to start my analysis somewhere else. And so you always, when you're employing method of joints, you always solve joints that have at most two unknown members. And so that keys into where you start. We can't start at joint B. We can't start at joint D and joint E. We can only start at either joint A or joint C. I'm going to, for, for our example in class, I'm actually going to start at joint A and just sort of start the left 
work my way over right. There's no, that's not the right way of doing it or the wrong way of doing it. I'm just, just pick one and went with it. Um, a couple other things before we actually start digging into the example. Uh, first off, um, one of the things you'll notice, I went ahead and gave you the support reactions. I hope by now that we have just beat support reactions into the ground. And so what you might see in the next few trust analysis examples is I'm just going to give you the support reactions. I, I hope that, that you sort of trust me on those values. So for instance, I got 15 kips going to the right at E. So AX is 15 kips to the left. And if you look, I got 30 kips going down and you can see I got 30 kips going up. This is 12 and a half and this is 17 and a half. But ultimately, that adds up to uh, to 30 kips. Um, last thing I want to point out, you'll notice with this truss, all of the members are at the same slope ratio. They're at a three to four slope ratio. So when we look at our diagonal members, we won't have to try and figure that out because they're all the same. On Friday, when we do our next truss example, they're not going to be all at the same slope ratio. They're going to be at different slope ratios. So we're going to have to make sure that we're cognizant and, and keeping track of our bookkeeping. Uh, any questions before we dig right into this? All right, let me go ahead and stop the share. One other thing I'll point out, um, if you notice here on the board, I've got the truss drawn, but I drew all of the members with dashed lines. I'll probably hop back and forth between the, the board and the screen because I'll make a point with this. But uh, you'll see as I as I uh, solve the structure, I'll be filling these uh, these lines in. So let me share the screen. Move my keyboard over here. All right. And again, feel free to uh, uh, break out the. Uh, microphone and ask any questions that you've got. Let me make sure my pen's working. Okay. Come on. Okay. So here's my truss. And again, like I said, I can't solve joint B, joint D, or joint E right now. Jo the two joints on the top, they have three unknowns each, and joint B has four unknowns each. So I got to start with either joint A or joint C. It actually doesn't matter which one I start out with first. So I'm going to do uh, joint A first, just again, like I said, I'm going to start at the left, work my way over to the right. And so let's just take each one of these joints one at a time and see how this works. Okay, so let's start off with joint A. So I tend to just say, okay, joint A, uh, you know, start out with that. Okay, okay, so the first thing that, that I do with joint A, and I'm going to do the first one, and then I might ask for some help on the later ones, but we'll start off with our joint. And the next thing I want to do is I want to draw the members going into joint A. And if you look at this, I have diagonal member and I have a straight member here. Let me see if I can do a little better on that. Diagonal, straight. That's a little better. Okay. So there's our members. The next thing that I do is I start uh, drawing in the loads that I know. Okay. So are, in other words, are there any loads that are applied to the joint? Well, yes, I've got this vertical load right here. This is 12.5 kips. And then I have this load here, which is 15 kips. Okay. So I, I apply the loads there. The next thing I ask is, do I know any of the members going into the joint? In other words, did I know any of those internal forces in either that diagonal member or that horizontal member before I started the analysis? No, I, I just started. Uh, and then the last thing I do is I start drawing my unknowns. Okay, now this diagonal, this is at a slope ratio. This is four to three. And so anytime I have a diagonal, I go ahead and split that up into its vertical component and its horizontal component. And then I've got this horizontal component here. And so let me go ahead and name those. So this diagonal, that's member AD. So we'll call this ADY, call this ADX. Then we'll call this member AB. All right. 
And I just draw those with little dashed lines because I right now I don't know what they are. And that's just sort of my way of, uh, of drawing that out. Okay, everybody with me so far? And again, if you have any questions, just turn your mic on and, and let them go. Okay, now, now all this joint, okay? Now, what I do is I look at my unknowns and I ask myself, how many unknowns do I have? Well, the way I have this drawn, I've got two unknowns in the X direction and I have one unknown in the Y direction. And so because I have less unknowns in the Y direction than I do the X direction, I'm going to start off by summing forces in the Y direction. Okay. Now, I look at this member and I see, now for, first off, you know, let me be clear before we jump into this. You are more than welcome to draw your table and put everything going up and everything going down. Like, I'm not going to stop you. You go right ahead. But a lot of times with trust analyses, because it's so simple, I just sort of write the answer and just go with it. So I look at this joint and I have 12 and a half kips going up. So if I got 12 and a half kips going up, that ADY, that has got to be 12 and a half kips going down. Like it just happens to be. That one's easy. And so if you want, you can go ahead and update your little image and draw that going down. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now over here to the side, I'm going to make a, a little bit of a point here. Let me use a different color. Um, whenever you have some sort of diagonal member, I'll, I'll sort of draw two of them over here. And I've got my unknown forces. They either have to both point away or they both have to point toward, okay? In other words, they're either both yanking the member or they're both pushing toward the member, okay? The idea is the member's either experiencing tension or it's experiencing compression, all right? And and I, I did sort of just, you know, throw that out there. And there might be a couple things throughout this that I kind of just throw out there. If there's any questions, don't hesitate either in the chat or with your microphone to stop me and go, wait, whoa, what are you doing here? Okay. All right. Now, we've got this vertical component uh, of ADY. One of the things that you can do whenever you have a diagonal member, whenever you have the vertical component of that member, you can immediately solve for the horizontal and vice versa. If you have the horizontal, you can immediately solve for the vertical. And you can do that through the use of the member's slope ratio. See, truss members carry only axial load, so the resultant force has to go along that diagonal member. So the components are going to follow the slope ratio of the member just like the member does. In other words, I can say that ADX is to 3 as ADY is to 4. And I'm again, the X goes with the 3, this part right there. The Y goes with the four, that part right there. Just use the, the slope ratios uh, accordingly. Therefore, I've got ADY, I need ADX, and that's three quarters ADY, which is three quarters of 12.5. And I'm actually going to go ahead and track all those decimals out. When you check that out, you'll get. 9.375 kips. Uh, and I'm doing that just A to be exact for this particular example, uh, but B, like all of the values for this particular analysis are pretty unique, so it'll help us identify what values we're talking about. Okay. And then as for your direction, make sure you're recognizing that that has to point that way because they both have to point towards the joint. Now, I did those two. Somebody else in chat tell me what's AB going to be. Like if you're following along with me, I want somebody either with the chat or the microphone to tell me what is AB going to be and what direction it's going to be. Teen Kips, the difference between 15 and 9.375. What is going to be the difference? Because 
with the directions. They're both going to the left. It would be the sum of ADX yep. and the 15 kits at this point of time. So, so 15 yep. and 9.375, that's going to be 24.375. Yep. Now, your, your statement, I don't know who said that before, but your statement would be right if the 15 kips was going the other way or if AD was in tension. Uh, but yeah, that's going to be going. It's going to be going that way. So that's going to be going like that. D does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? Okay. Now, last thing that I'm going to do is before I close out this this uh, joint analysis, I have a diagonal member, and whenever I have a diagonal member. I'm going to go ahead and determine the resultant. So I have uh, AD, and uh, the way I determine AD, if I have ADX and I have ADY, I just say Pythagorean theorem. So that is uh, 9.375 kips squared plus 12.5 kips squared. And so, somebody want to check that out for me? My phone is making all sorts of noise over here. I'm going to turn that off. Okay. Let's see. 15.625. There we go. Okay. And so, therefore, I'm going to put over this here on the side. I've got AB and AD. So, we determined AB 24.375. Now, AB, notice how I've got the arrow pointing away from the joint. So, whenever I have the arrow pointing away from the joint, that member is experiencing tension. With AD, both of those members are pointing towards the joint. So that is 15.625 kips in compression. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and sort of circle that. All right. I don't, I, the last thing I want to do is just, you know, blow through this. If there's anybody that has any questions, if, if there's anything that's a little fuzzy, I really want to make sure that's clear before we move on to the next joint. Uh, are there any questions? So far, so good. So far, so good. Awesome. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to turn my camera off or, or, or the, the, the screen off for a bit set or for a quick second, bit second, quick second, because I want to show you something. So everybody here should see the truss. Um, I want to do something real quick. So here's the truss. Remember how I drew everything? Uh, remember how I drew everything in, in with dashed lines? Now, we just did joint A. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take this member and I'm going to fill it in. Let me make that kind of dark. And you can do this however you want. Um, we got this member. We got this member. Okay. And I'm also going to go ahead and write the answers on the truss. So this AB, or, or sorry, this AD, this was 15.625 kips in compression. This was 24. 0.375 kips in tension. Okay. First of all, I, I think it's kind of a good idea whenever you're doing a truss problem to maybe, and it doesn't have to be super neat. You can draw this out on a, a piece of scratch paper and just sort of have it off the side because you want to make sure that you're, you got a clear picture in your head of the big picture. Okay. So we just did joint A and we got this member and this member. Okay. And so what do we do next? Well, can we investigate joint B? Well, not yet, because joint B, we have still have one, two, three unknowns. And then you can see why I drew them as dashed lines, because we don't know. We, we have too many unknowns at joint B uh, to assess this. Now, we could go ahead and do joint C, but again, I kind of want to start at the left and work my way over. And I also want to use the results I just got. Okay, so 
I'm going to go ahead and do joint D. And I can do that now because I've got one, two unknowns. I'm going to use the results from joint A to investigate joint D. Okay. So now let's, let's go down a bit. And again, if you need to hop back and forth between the, the, the screen and the camera to see the board, you know, go right ahead. Let's go ahead and look at joint D. Okay. So first thing that we'll do is we'll plop our joint down and let's draw our members. So we have a member like that, got a member like that, and a member like that. Actually, let me make that a little, little, little short. Okay, there we go. All right. Next thing that we do is we ask, are there any loads applied at joint D? And the answer is yes. If you switch over to the camera, you'll see we got that 10 kip load applied downward at joint D. So I need to put that there. I'll tell you, whenever you're doing a joints analysis, it the most important aspect is your bookkeeping, making sure that you're keeping track of, you know, what members you've already solved for, that you're drawing your arrows the right way, that you don't forget to put the loads that are on the joints. Really, the, 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 the analysis isn't difficult. It's just the bookkeeping. Make sure you don't forget stuff. Okay. All right. Next thing that we do is we need to ask ourselves, do we know any of the members going into this joint? And this time, the answer is yes. We know this one. All right. We know that and we know that. See, it's these dashed ones here. These are the ones that we don't know but we do know those ones that are on the bottom, okay? So let's take this and let's start writing in the values that we know. So this one right here, this is ADX and this is ADY. Now we know ADX and ADY. ADX is 9.375 kips and this is 12.5 kips. And we just got that from up here. You know, these are the values that we got up there, 12.5 and 9.375. Now, here's the kicker, okay? And I'm going to ask the chat on this. Let's take ADX, okay? ADX. Do I draw that arrow pointing to the left or do I draw that arrow pointing to the right? Okay, we, uh-oh, we have contention. Somebody's saying the left, somebody's saying the right. Let me ask you this way. How about this? Let's take member AD. Just look at member AD. Is AD in compression or is AD in tension? AD is in compression. If I have a member in compression, do I draw the arrows toward the joint or do I draw the arrows away from the joint? So think about it that way. Now, what way do I draw the arrows? We had some contention in the chat. So are they, is the arrow going to be drawn to the left or drawn to the right? It's going to go to the right. Going to go to the right. That is correct. And so this going one's going to go to the right. Other. Exactly, exactly. So if this is going to the right here, this is going to, the, uh, going to be going upward. See, remember this, all right? All right. Remember your secret weapon of structural engineering, right? So here's a member. Let's say I have a member and I cut a section through it and I split those halves apart. I'm going to have a member like this. And then I'm going to have a member like this. And if on this side, the arrow, let's say, is pointing away, equal and opposite, going to be pointing away. So on the other side of the joint, the arrow goes in the opposite direction. Okay, and so the easiest way is to just look at the, is it compression? Then they're always pointing toward. If it's attention, then they're always pointing away. It, this, is, this is an easy thing to, to trip up on. It's okay uh, to, to trip up on this. Okay. And so now we've got, what do we have? We have 
this is member BD. So this is BDX. This is B D oh, BD. Not the gas station. This is member. What is it? D E. Which, by the way, I don't care if you call the members B D or D B. I, I don't care about that. Just whatever. I've always just gone alphabetical, but that doesn't matter. Okay. If you've got this, then we can start chugging through this joint a, a lot easier than we have, you know, the other. Because it's here's the thing. Once you get the hang of it, the method of joints actually starts getting a little boring. And if it gets boring, that means that we're doing something right because that means that, that you know how to do it. Okay. Now I got two unknowns in the horizontal. I got one unknown in the vertical. So we're going to sum forces in the y direction. And then we ask ourselves, okay. I got 12.5 kips going up, and I got 10 kips going down. So that means that BDY, I got 12.5 12 going up, I got 10 going down. I don't have enough going down. BDY has got to be 2.5 kips going down. There's just, there's not enough going down. So that means this goes down. Now, if that goes down, that means this goes to the right. They both point away. Remember, that's 4 and 3. I'm going to rewrite that 4. Here we go. Better. And so I've got uh, my slope ratio. If I, if I know the, the vertical component, I can determine the horizontal. So BDX is to 3 as B, D, Y is to four. And for this problem, all the slope ratios are the same. The next problem, they're gonna change. So like, I, I'm gonna just blow through the slope ratios on this problem, but in the next problem, you gotta be a little more cognizant of that. So B, D, X is three quarters of B, D, Y, which is Three quarters of two and a half, that ends up being 1.875, and that's going to be pointing this way. All right, sum of forces in the x direction. So I got, so look at your joint. I got 9.375 going to the right. I got BDX going to the right. That means that DE, I have nothing going to the left. Everything's going to the right. DE has to go to the left. So DE is going to be just the sum of those. 9.375 kips plus 1.875 kips. And we know it's going to the left. And so DE is, what was that, 9... 10, 11, 11 point 25. And then, oh, I forget my error. Then the last thing I'm going to do, I got a diagonal. So BD is just my Pythagorean theorem applied to my components. And if I'm going too fast, you let me know. You aren't going to hurt my feelings. Y'all are paying your tuition, so I want y'all to get your money's worth on this. All right. Pythagorean theorem on this, 1.875 squared plus 2.5 squared. Take square all that, and then you'll get 3.125. It actually comes out exactly. One of the reasons that all these numbers are coming out exactly is because these are all 3, 4, 5 triangles. So the numbers are going to come out pretty uh, neat. A BD then is 3.125 kips. DE is 11.20 kips. Somebody in chat help me out. Remember BD, is that in compression or tension? Remember BD, compression or tension? Making sure everybody's paying attention. There we go. So this is tension. And the, the other member, DE, want to make sure everybody's paying attention. All 
There we go. All right. All right. I'm going to give everybody a sec to catch up on the notes. Uh, and then I want to show you something here on the whiteboard because we've got a little bit of a strategy decision we have to, to make right here. And I want to point something out. But I'll give everybody a sec to catch up. Okay. Don't forget, I'm using the uh, uh, the Microsoft Teams uh, notebook, so you can always um, refer to that. Okay, so we got this member. We got this member. And so this one is 11.25 uh, in compression. And this one is 3.125 in tension. Okay. Now, we got a little bit of a situation here because we now go to our next joint. We have to ask ourselves, which joint do we analyze? And we could always go to joint C. What's wrong with that? In fact, that, that actually is a pretty good candidate if we want to simplify our analysis. But I want to make a point about joint B and joint E. Okay. How many unknowns do we have remaining at joint B? We have one, two. How about joint E? One, two. So technically we could do either one. It wouldn't really matter. I'm going to make a point right now that right now it is a lot easier to do joint B than it is joint E. And here's why. Joint B has one diagonal and one horizontal. Okay, joint E, two diagonals. And that two diagonals part, that matters, okay? Um, when possible, you want to avoid two diagonals, okay? We're actually on Monday going to explore what happens when you don't have a choice and you have to do uh, two diagonals. I'm going to show you how to do that. But the long story short is it's going to involve you breaking out your Casio and having to do two equations and two unknowns. We really haven't had to deal with that so far because we haven't had a joint that's had two diagonals. And when possible, avoid that. So don't do joints with two diagonals if you can't. I'm going to do joint B because this one, just because they're two diagonals, is going to be harder. And you shouldn't have to do two diagonals on any of your homework assignments uh, until next week. Yeah, so we are going to do it. It's just going to be a while. Okay, so I'm going to get through joint B. Um, I'm probably going to do this one a bit fast because at this point, hopefully, it's getting to be a bit repetitive. So draw our joint. Then we start drawing our members. All right, next thing you know, we ask, are there any loads applied at joint B? The answer is yes. We have 20 kips going down. All right. Then we ask, are there any members that we already know? And that's where having a sketch like what I have here on the board is so valuable because sometimes it's kind of difficult to go back to all your joints like, okay, which member did I solve? Did I solve this one or solve that one? It's here. I know I've solved this one. And I know I've solved that one. It's these two on the right. I got to figure out. So I know that this is an unknown. I know this is an unknown and I know that's an unknown. And so we'll go ahead and name those. We'll call that BC. We'll call this B E X B E Y and don't forget three to four. And now we'll go ahead and uh, write down the ones we do know. Now this diagonal, that diagonal was in tension. So I know I got that and that, and they're both pointing away, both pointing away. B D Y was uh, 2.5 kips. And I, another way of looking at it, I got this drawn up on the previous joint. I had it drawn down. And this is BDX. BDX is 1.875.
And then we have this one, this uh, horizontal member that's in tension. So it's drawn away. And that's member AB. And AB was uh, 24.375. All right. And so now the formula becomes, the, it's the same thing. You know, we just look at it. There's two horizontal unknowns, one vertical unknown. So uh, some forces in the y direction. Now, this, you know, you got to look at this. You got to pay attention. I got two and a half kips uh, going up. But I got 20 kips going down. I certainly don't have enough going up, so this has got to go up. So BEY is 17 and a half kips going up. And again, if I'm going too fast on that, let me know. But I'm just looking at all my verticals, and I only had the two and a half going up and 20 going down, so I need a lot more going up. So that's going up, which makes this go to the right. And so I use my slope ratio. And this is easy because I can just say at this point, BEX is three quarters of BEY because I've been doing the same thing the past few joints. And so that comes out, so three quarters of that, that comes out to 13.125 kips. And that's going to go this way. And then I sum forces in the X direction. And what do I have? Well, if you want, this might be one where it's worthwhile to draw a table out, you know, to make sure that you're tracking correctly. You know, so I got 1.875 here. I got 24.375 here. The BEX I just solved was 13.125 kips here. And you ask, okay, well, what direction does BC have to go? And I look, that's a lot over there on the left. I don't have quite enough on the right. So that BC has got to go on the right. And so... If you need to draw the table out, go right ahead. It's okay. There's a lot going on with this joint, so there's nothing wrong with that. Um, when it's all said and done, you get BC is 13.125 kips. And so the only thing I have to do is take care of my diagonal. And that comes out to be was at 21.875 kips. And so BC is 13.125 kips. BE is 21.875 kips. Oh, and I didn't do my directions. And just look at that. Both of them are in tension. They're both yanking away from the joint. So that's tension. Oh. While you all are catching up, I'm going to go ahead and put that on my uh, my whiteboard, and then I want to make a point about the very last joint because I know we're getting short on time, so I apologize if we're going a little fast. All right, now here's the thing about this last joint. Um, first off, I only have one member left. I only have member CE. And so you have to ask yourself, which joint do I solve? Do I just solve joint E or do I solve joint C? I'm a, I tend to think kind of lazily. I I'm, I'm think, always think to myself, you know, solve the joint that's easier. And there's just less going on over here than there is there, less room for error. So go ahead and solve joint C. Let's look at joint C. And if you've done your truss analysis correctly, your last joint will, it'll be kind of neat because if you draw that joint out, you know, I've got this member. I know this is 17.5 kips. I've got this diagonal. And remember, that's a four to three. And I know this member here is 13.125. That's B, uh, uh, BC. Now, check this out. This is pretty slick, okay? 
Let's look at my forces in the X direction. I have a BC going to the left, so that means this has to go to the right. And if I have a 17.5 going up, that means this has to go down. Right off the bat, I know I've done something because both of the arrows are both pointing towards the joint. Remember, they either both point towards the joint or they both point away from the joint. And if I look at each of those components independently, you can see that they're both pointing towards the joint. This is C, E, X, C, E, Y. Now, if I write these out, I know we're getting short on time, so I'll, I'll try and rush this out. Now, if I just use my sum of forces in the X direction wider, uh, independently, I'm going to get C, E, X is 13.125 kips and C, E, Y is 17.5 kips. And again, there's my directions. Now watch this. Let's put a note over here on the side. CEX divided by CEY. If you chug this out, 13.125 kips divided by 17.5 kips. If you plug that in your calculators, what you're going to get is 0 0.75. And why is that important? Because your slope ratio is 3 over 4. That's 0 0.75. And so what that tells you is if you look at that last joint, your answer should be compatible. The error should point the same way and the component should match your slope ratio. Your last joint will reveal that. Let me just make sure I complete this out. So when we chug that out, we get uh, 21.875. They're both towards, so they're both in compression. So if you look at the board, if you switch over your camera, and you'll see I've got the diagram completed now. This is 21.875 in compression. If you want to know what the answer is to this problem, the board, that's the answer, okay? Because the entire truss is solved. Every force in every member is determined, and then the designer can go in and start picking members that can safely resist those loads. I know we, we crunched that in a bit near at the end. I was worried that, I'm always worried that trusses, they always tend to take up a lot of time. Um, but if there's anybody still on the line, anybody have any questions before we, uh, we close it? All right. You have a, uh, you have a homework assignment. Uh, for a, a similar truss, it's, it's pretty much the same size. Uh, it's just a cantilever truss. Uh, I want that done by Friday. And then we're what we're going to do is we're going to look at two things on Friday. We're going to look at a truss that has different slope ratios on different members. Uh, and then we're going to talk about something we haven't talked about yet, which is indeterminacy. How do you handle a truss that is statically, or sorry, uh, internally, uh, well, how do you determine its indeterminacy? We'll handle it later on in the semester, but I want to make sure that we can determine its indeterminacy uh, 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 through, a, through a, a similar formula. All right, that's all I have. I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to go ahead and call it. Um, all the calculations are in the team's notebook, so if you need to go back to that, uh, they're there. And if you have any questions, let me know. That's all I've got. We will see you all on Friday.